Okay. So I'm, I'm going to send this to everybody, which I always do. And uh, but I want to go over this next week. We'll, I will be in here and approximately, I should have it set up, I would think, between 12.30, 1 o'clock at the latest, uh, the practical. <clears throat> and what it involves, I'll say, I don't think we'll put joints on it. I'll just put out bones. And there'll be probably around 20 stations where you'll have to pretty much identify a bone at, or one or more bones and a feature or two. I think there'll be three responses. I'll have a word bank. I'll have the answer sheet. You can bring in one sheet of paper front and back with notes on it. So effectively, you can write down anything that you want or copy images or put them on a piece of paper front and back of any of the material on the bones you want. So uh, as long as it's on one standard sheet of, you know, standard notebook paper, eight and a half by 11 paper that we, you know, that'll come out of a printer. So you can do that front or back. So that is your resource. So you can carry that around the word bank, the answer sheet and just go from point A to point B. And that should cover m much of what we have to do uh, on on Wednesday, a week from today, the 31st. So a lot of people had contacted me about that, so I wanted to make sure I got that information. So that's the first thing. So I'll reiterate that. In other words, I'll put that in an email to you and to everybody in the class, so everybody will know what's going on. And so just I'll be in the room setting up, but the door will be closed. Once I open the door, you can come in and start working. So I, I should, it shouldn't take me a whole lot longer than uh, if I get here, for, like I usually do between 11.30 and 12. So I should be able to get that set up in an hour easy. All right, that's the first thing. So I, now I had last time, I sent to everybody some video recordings I had done for this identical lab in the fall to just so you could see what I had, you know, the, I, probably was fairly thorough with that. And so I thought in addition to what I'm presenting here, it would be a good idea to add that to the picture. So that's what I did. So I want to pick up where we left off what I was talking about. I don't have a lot more to do with bones. I got the camera here that I suppose I can bring bones over and show people as well as what's going to be on this. So I don't have anybody logged in, but you'll all get a copy of this. So this is kind of where, thank you, this is kind of where we left off. I had talked a little bit about this, <clears throat> the pectoral girdle, the shoulder assembly, and that's kind of where it stopped. So just to review, these are considered part of the appendicular skeleton. This is this one's a two bone unit. The other one is a single bone we get to the lower extremity. And it's all about attaching it. So there's not a lot to say with it other than that about what's on there, okay? And it's very, very mobile, and it consists of the clavicle and the scapula. And I have a two-bone model that I had demonstrated with before. The important parts, there's, the clavicle is just a bone you have to know what it looks like. Uh, the fact that the sternal end is a little wider, like a big old triangle, like the base of, like the base of a building almost, it's sort of a triangular, or sort of comes to a, 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 an open bottom, as you'll see. But... Over here, when you look at three dimensionally, it's like, it's like a wide base, maybe like a pyramid, the base of a pyramid, but it's not a big deal. You just have to know, and I don't care about rights and lefts, because sometimes it's really like with a bone like the scapula, it's very difficult to see unless you've looked at it a lot to know which is which. So it's very, here's the right, and it's very confusing when you flip it right side up or upside down, so I don't worry about that. So this, that's the clavicle. The scapula has more anatomy and there's more questions on it. The scapula, and it's really, and without so much the angles of the borders, the important parts are the spine. The acromion is called the acromion. It's also known as the acromion process. And that's the part where it joins with the clavicle. And I'll show it to you up here. This is a very famous acromioclavicular joint or AC joint. It's two flat bones that come together. Let's see if my hands will show you. People look in the background, side to side, so it slips very easily. 
So that's what we call a separated shoulder when that happens, and there's various degrees. Where the shoulder sits in here, that's the important part with regard to shoulders dislocate there, they separate at that other joint, the acromial clavicular. So as we go back and look at it, this would be like you're looking at the thing from the front. <clears throat> Clavicles come in, as I'm drawing that imaginary line with the cursor that way. And the sternum is over here. That's the attachment. This bone is not attached at all to any other bones in the skeleton directly other than the head of the humerus, which will make the upper portion of your arm, and the clavicle, which anchors the whole assembly to the sternum. Other than that, it's just muscles around, so it moves a lot. This is called the coracoid process, and that's another important part where tendons attach, and really what holds the shoulder in, unlike almost any other joint, when you're looking over here, <clears throat> muscles and tendons more than anything else. Really, what, and that's why it's so easy to separate. It doesn't have the, the, a tremendous amount of bone to bone contact, and it doesn't have a really great socket for that ball to stick into, as you will see. The notch is not a big deal, it's just there between the bases. The acromium is an important part of the attachment of the clavicle and other structures, and the coracoid process. The cavity is more like a shelf than a cavity. It's got a subtle indentation, just a little bit concave. And so it's interesting about that, and I'll give you the analogy as they will when we look at the joints themselves. It's like a golf ball sitting on top of a tee. Now the ball sits on top of the tee fine, but there's very, very little contact, but it gives it a lot of motion. And on the back, you have the very famous shoulder blade or spine of the scapula. And what's important about that is it divides the back of the bone, the posterior aspect, into sort of hollow cavity areas of bone where muscles sit. When we get to the muscles, which I'll probably talk about and send you some information on, is these are some of the muscles that make up what's called the rotator cuff, which allows you to generate whether in almost any sport or activity, whether throwing a ball, a baseball, a football, a tennis racket, uh, any type of sport that you might do, we use a lot of uh, arm movements, anything along those lines, they're so easy to damage that rotator cuff. And so it's part of the muscles sit in these little fossa, one above the spine called supraspinous, one below the spine called infraspinous. And as you'll see, one that's on the anterior aspect of the scapula called the subscapular, because the scapula kind of sits a little higher in the back. So the undersurface of the scapula is kind of pointing downward. And there is the cavity, but it's not nearly this big. I think they're just doing that, the glenoid cavity for that purpose. Which brings us to, and that really is where we concluded, we have this consistent, we see it both upper and lower extremity. You have the arm, the humerus, one bone, the forearm, the radius and the ulna, two bones that are sort of bound together by fibrous tissue and function is more or less as a unit. And then eight bones in the wrist, we call carpal bones, the metacarpals five and the phalanges four, which is really your hand and your fingers. So we see it over here. Now I'll pull out the humerus. Biceps. Well, the biceps break the eye. Biceps means two heads. One of the heads 
has a tendon that comes up right in here and secures, it kind of holds the head into the shoulder apparatus. The other one, the shorter head, kind of goes up sideways and inserts into that core foot process. So one insert, inserts right on top of the glenoid, probably on the right and left, exactly. More or less inserts, sits like this. So, even though it's a very long way, it's a long bone, but big one. The long head comes all the way up this way. So I gave a key and I used it like this. Kind of comes up this way. It goes all the way into here, and the short head comes up kind of into here. So there are two different ways of supporting it. So the big anatomy on this is the name of the bone. And the name of the bone again, and when you just came in, when we do the practical, you'll be able to have like a sheet of how uh, patients give you this, which is a study guide, and the word thing. Okay. But you can have another piece of paper like this, run back, covered with anything you want about the bones to a resource and I'll, and I'll have an answer sheet and I'll have the bones in seven in the 18 or 20 stations with three questions. And basically it's like name the bone, the humerus, this would be the head, this would be, there's a lot of features on this bone. <coughs> this again are both the tubercles and this is the intertubercular groove. The big muscle here on the side, let's do this, Called the deltal, so there's a roughened area here. Not so, not so well demonstrated on plastic. That it is called the deltal exuberosity. It's so much work to do this kind of deltal. And then the parts of the joint are here. So here you have basically the way the joint makes up their elbow is much more complicated than a lot of people would think. If I'm lucky, I have a lot of it. Um, yeah. Here's a real bone that's been wired together. And what it is, even though it's all beat up, you kind of get the idea. So, again, you have a series of face, and the leg is not a whole lot different, even though the bones are a bit different. You have the head and the groove, this is the one that would be on your left. And you have a couple of really significant, a big part. This would be, this would be the one on the left. And so what you would have is the groove coming up again through the head to help secure that in the joint. Not a whole lot. That deltoid two brush is kind of rounded out here a little bit more. And then there's not a whole lot. These are called condyles. Condyles have a smooth surface in front where they cover your cartilage to basically allow your elbow to move normally, like this. And so outside of the condyles, this is where you have ligaments attached to stabilize. And you hear about an athlete having to get a Tommy John surgery. It's interestingly enough that modified. Very common injury involves a ligament here for the ulnar collateral ligament. Again, the pitchers and football players, and soccer players put stuff in extremity. So again, you know, they're much more lower so injury types. So we don't see the same type of injury in American football. We see from all types, which is the place the nation's throwing the ball this year. So nevertheless, those collateral ligaments go from here, the ulnar collateral ligament, that famous one in that surgery, goes from this really big bump, it's called the medial epicondyl, you can feel it on yourself here. That's the one that allows you, all the muscles that allow you to do this, to flex your wrist and roll it over this, and basically it's actually, you actually feel it. So it's under, it really gets a lot of stress. And so that's an epicondyl, and there's a little bump here on the lateral side, you can do this Stand. You can feel it over on this side. So those are interesting landmarks. And then these two are very distinctive. Those are the plastic bones. Is you have this kind of here. 
she had me up and on the hill moving back. It's called the owner group. The nerve, you hit your funny bone. You do this, it's like, oh. Okay, it's right, really right in this bone here. So last time I was watching, for whatever reason, looking at this new surgery here, because there's an actor who was having a gun. And they had a video of this new surgery, but they had really nothing to do with this book. Right? And put a graph in there, they just sort of reinforce it. Watching them, the most important part is they had to carefully lift this ulnar nerve away to make sure they didn't the end. That was really the extensive part of the surgical procedure. It's fascinating. Having done things like that similarly myself, was insisted on it you know, when I was arrested in the hospital. You know, 45 years ago, so don't, don't mention it. A long time ago, that's the kind of stuff that we did. Things like that was in its infancy. So what we had is they pull that little bit of nerve away and then drill a hole here and then drill a hole. So one here and one here. And just to put it almost like a, a, a almost like a, like a, a material that was made to act like a ligament that was biological. Uh, nevertheless, <clears throat> so they have unique shapes and they're unique because of kind of the way that the two of them, I have my eyes on here, the way they interact. This surface is like a pull. So a name is in, in ancient times, they called that a trophy. So it had like an hourglass shape. And the bone that fits in there, to look at, which is here, this very, very large one. That, that part of your elbow that you bang all the time. That's called the ulna. This is called the acromion process. You'll see that in a second. That has a groove that's sort of like the made of this. So it has like a raised ridge that fits right in here. But what's very interesting about that is you can do this. And it's so secure, it's almost a perfect thing. So much so that you can hold your, your elbow this way and still rotate. That's because of this two joint apparatus that's there. The combination of these two bones together act that way. So you can hold it here. If you look inside the base of the ulna, you can see the ribs that fits into this groove. That is really what creates the perfect tension of the joint. On the other side, this is called the capitula because this is called the radial head. Head of the radius sits on as a cap on it, with an pixel. Because it sits on it. What it does, the radius and the ulna up here form a separate joint that does this. Well, so that's what allows you to pull that pronation, pull that supination. So it's a really neat way that we can do that. We can even do that with your arm and cast with a brace. Be able to still, but it feels like moving your wrist, so the motion is coming. So that's another joint. That's there. So you have a radial and ulnar joint here, here. And we'll do this because the next section is about joints. So we understand how the joints work by looking at the shape of bones. So you have the head, the intertubercular groove, the deltoid tuberosity, so we're over here with that ridge. And on this side, you have the capitulum. And on this side, you have the trochlea. And that very, very large, distinctive feel of the kind of There are all parts of the anatomy. The radius and the ulna themselves are two bones. One day I'll be organized. Not Why do people move my bones? Made it so it's a little hard to demonstrate with the other 
the two of them kind of sit like this. They form a unit. And there's a band of tibia. See your leg. You have the tibia and the fibula that work, and you have a band between them, a big, thick ligament that binds them. So this one can move quite a bit. So you have that ridge area, that central sort of high ridge that fits right into that group, creating it. You have this piece that's here, that's really where the joint is. This is called the electron on the bump in the back here, although relatively easy to break. We saw a lot of those. We treated a lot of older folks. I was in a hospital that's really no longer there, and, and, and a really difficult area in the inner city in Philadelphia, North Philadelphia, near Temple University. And it, it, we saw the most bizarre injuries, gunshot wounds, stab wounds, fights. We treated the city's prison population. And a contract for that. And I mean, bizarre injuries. At the age I was doing that, the residents were up in our late 20s, we had a lot of benefits, a lot of health, a lot of people. So that, so that, that, we call that one, there's a trochlea, and then you could, some people call this the only notch, the electronon. And then, interestingly enough, the head is very small down here. The most noteworthy thing is that little point called the styloid. So the styloid is a term we use a lot because it's a stylus, right? So you can feel on your wrists here, bumped here, here. So I broke my wrist. The reality is probably didn't. You're probably you injured the styloid process of the ulna. And the radius has even a larger one. Kind of like the base of the double part of the back. And then the most distinctive thing is here, <clears throat> the radial head. This is this is called the biceps tuberosities, where that big biceps muscle attaches, attaches on the thumb side to the radius. And the radial head, kind of like a mushroom cat, sits inside of a little socket here. I have a little pink marker, red marker. Okay, so that particular area is a small fossa or a notch. Okay, so they call that the ulnar notch. It's a little notch that fits the head of the radius, so we do that. So there's a lot, I mean, comparatively speaking, these bones between the humerus, the radius, and the ulna have a lot of features. The wrist bones, there's not a whole lot to say other than the name of the bones. I'm sure. We have, I had a really good monocle that actually got from another school. Got from the inner school. It's like this. So that's an actual human bone. Well, my guess would be one. Delicate, not a child. Uh, <clears throat> you have four bones, and they sort of sit, march this way. You can imagine your wrist kind of looks like that. So it sits kind of on that kind of an angle. So you have two sets. So you have a set called proximal, the one that's closest to your to the rest of your arm. Here and then one after, we call this one. In this case, you typically look at them from the thumb side to the pinky side. So you're kind of going backwards. In this case, it's going from lateral to medial. And so you have four, these bones are pretty much together with a couple of little exceptions. So, These four are pretty much together, they're not drawn together. So the first row and the bone that kind of, at least in the anatomy size, stuck up the highest was here. So it was called the S, which stood for scapula. So like when a painter's painting something on a scapula. That's what they said in the center of the painting seal, that's all the 
put blanks on the lab. This was it looked a little bit like a moon at least to them. I don't get it myself. They called it Lune. Okay. The T here was triquetral. And the little bone with a P looks a little bit like a P. It's an interesting bone that is not attached. It kind of it's just it's a tent. Feel it almost at the base of your own neck for a piece of bone. That's another one that's to jam before you hit that. You know it. Then the second row is just the proximal row, the distal row has the T diversity of your trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, So I, the way anatomy students usually do is they try to figure out a way to memorize that by I making mean, clever like saying out of the first letters. It's a little bit of mine. And I did that, I did that for years in anatomy. There's so many of them. You can look them up. <clears throat> the only one here that's one of the names. There's one bit of anatomy here, and there's somebody hurts the heel of their hand right in the here at the base of the bone is called the hammy, this is called the shell, it's called the hammies. And that's really the extent of the anatomy because metacarpals and phalanges aren't that, to me, they're not that distinctive. We just number one through five, first, second, third, fourth, fifth. And the phalanges, you have, in the thumb, you only have two, distal and proximal. And in all the others, three, four, and five, you have distal, proximal, middle, and just the same. Exactly the same as the foot. Interesting one is here. The base of the first metacarpal and the trapezium. That's another one of those saddle joints. That's a unique joint because of the saddle shape that allows us to impose our bones. So that's you know, that's one of the more interesting ones. It's, it, there's a lot. It's like when somebody hurts themselves. So If you go back to soccer players, and if you're like me, maybe you're more into soccer. I, I like American football, right now European football. So I'm Steelers and Man United. Right now, more Man United. One more point for the champions. No United fans here? Huh? What? Chelsea? Chelsea. Oh, you're. United, Britain, Campus, Valley Law, Pardon? Okay, they're trying to get messy. But trying to think of who the player was. When we get to the foot, they'll talk about what's called the list strengths. I was reading about it yesterday. I'll show you where it is. They're certainly in the hand for an athlete who uses their hand, a basketball player or a tennis player. You injure them in those areas, like the metacarpal trapezial area, or the certain bones that are in here. They deteriorate. They're very, very difficult to work. So they're gone in here. So it's just, and so if you look at it you know, from a soccer perspective, there are certain injuries that are worse than others. Like if you united, you'll see it in the foot. You ever get a great year out of the son of the Martinez, who's the Argentine defense bill about five times. Great, close to the year. What he did, I watched him play. Because, you know, they were playing with Seville, there was a little in the Europa League, and he yanked this piece of bone off. It's a very famous scratch called Sir Robert Jones scratch. This is called the two Rossi of the metaphors. He did that. He's told what I, I saw many, many things. The trouble is for an athlete to have to operate. So he's pretty no heel. 
I mean, that's not one of the ones you go worry about. That was Frank's one. Way down in here, the second metatarsal, as you can see, here's the first, here's the second. The second metatarsal is set deeper, and this is the call of the Lisfranc's joint. It's not one, but there's many joints over there, but it's like a cornerstone of your foot. So you can't push off. But I'll get into that with the ankles in a second. Hold on, let me. What do they want? Why does somebody send me a thing that says good morning? It's not morning. No idea. Moving on. So. Uh, Here we are. So I'll show you the pictures of these and move on. Like I said, we're not going to be here that terribly long. There aren't a lot of us today. So, the humerus, the longest and strongest, just like the femur. The head, I just consider the head and the anatomical and surgical necks are really not something we need to cover here. The tubercles, and again, that intertubercular sulcus. So I'll show you where they are. So here's the illustration, the head. Here you, the anatomical neck is right under the head, but that is, the surgical neck is near where it breaks more commonly. That's the distinction. Here are the tubercles. They're called lesser and greater. They're called that because of their position, how high they sit. The lesser, even though sometimes it's bigger, sits below the greater. And this is that famous group. Here's the deltoid tuberosity. Here you have the medial epicondyle. Then you have the trochlea and the capitulum. And on the back, you have a little, this is where that bone coming, the olecranon coming off the ulna kind of pockets in. So you can see, and this is what the joints look like. The right, here's the capitulum and the head of the radius. Here's that notch on the ulna that allows it to rotate. Here in the back, that olecranon, again, part of the ulna, that fits into this socket back here that sort of is the stop. So you can't, if you, you don't really hyperextend your elbow. You'll break your elbow more likely. The medial and lateral epicondyles, and you can see those there. So here you see, and they have a membrane between them. It makes them kind of function as one. The head, so as you, let me go back, one, two, four. So, the olecranon and the coronoid process grip the, basically grip that hinge and that notch for the trochlea. The radial notch, just distal to it for the head of the radius, and the styloid. So you can see it here. Here's the notch. Here's the olecranon. Here's that trochlear notch for the, for the humerus joint. Here is this membrane that holds them together. And they're held together. This is one of the things that when you see it at the ankle, everybody, this area here where these bones come together is a weak point. And when you hear about someone having their different kinds of ankle sprains, they get them there. Okay. Now, and so again, not a whole lot to say. These are the names of the bones, and they'll do a better job the scaphoid lunate triquetrum or triquetral 
Lepiziform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hammy, and then the metacarpal entity. And that's, uh, I'll use it. I print up these illustrations as well as using the bones so you have something to look at when we do this for practical. And again, you can bring in a full size piece of you know, printer paper with, you know, the front and back with notes on it to help you take the test. So you can begin to see all of this. And they count all the different bones and these, the way that we've arranged them. The next part is the lower extremity. And the lower extremity is, uh, is easier because the bones are bigger. And so you start off with the hip. And I have one of those up there all put together. But really, the hip is what, what and it goes by another name, Oscoxa. But most people just call it the hip bone. It doesn't involve the sacrum. That's where it attaches three bones, the ilium, the largest, ischium, thickest, pubis, the smallest. So the ilium is where it connects to the sacrum. That's the very, very solid point between the appendicular and axial skeleton. The ischium, you, you're sitting on it as am I right now. That's that bone you can feel in your rear end. And the pubis is really the point in the dead center, sort of under the belly button, where the bones come together. That inherently has some give to it, particularly so in women vis-a-vis -vis having a baby. So you know, I'll show you the parts of the bone in a second. So I'll show you the iliac crest. Points that are important anatomically are the anterior and posterior spines for structures that attach. The notch, there's two notches, the largest is the greater, and there's one called the lesser for the sciatic nerve. Uh, and I'll show you the different surfaces that are there as well. The ischium basically has the two porosity, which you sit on, not a whole lot else. And the pubis, again, there's not a whole lot else, but together, you're gonna see the ischium and the pubis come together and create an opening called the obturator foramen. And a lot of important structures, muscles and nerves go through there. So a lot of times when people will get impingements, uh, problems with, with strained groin muscles, which you hear a lot. So again, you're watching soccer and you see somebody just pulls up out of nowhere. And a lot of times it'll just give. You, you're seeing them more now. Somebody went down with one, oh, that Acuna, that really good player from Argentina who's from Seville. And he was, they were playing in the game. I think he went off like 20 minutes into the game. It was obviously a hamstring, just, just game. And all of a sudden he's like reaching back, oh, done. These three bones come together and the most important structure is the very large socket called the acetabulum. So they all participate as the term that we use to call nerve performance. So I have that big letter C. That's the acetabulum. That's a really big sock. You look at the femur, it's a really big bone. That's a real long sock. I like the one that you see with the shoulder, but again, it's a dog voice. Very, very small. So you have the acetabulum, all three bones. This is the obturator brain. This field to the rods. There's not a lot of confusion. Iliac crest, which you can hand on your hip, you can feel it. It's a greater sciatic notch. For the big sciatic nerve, lesser sciatic notch, this is the spine of the ischium. This roughened area is where it sits in here. That's the auricular surface, which looks like here. And then they aren't very distinctive on these older specimens, but these are spines, anterior and posterior, superior, and you have important muscles in the bone. You can see them on them distinctive. And the bone is just as well as you do when they create a skeleton, so they die. The femur, longest and strongest bone, has a head, a neck. These are called trochanters. 
giant muscles attached there. His whole area has the gluteal muscles that are your posterior, your end, your buttocks, full of gluteal tuberosity. The big muscles in your thighs come together and really anchor themselves in the back, even though most of them are in the front. If you get the zoom and look at the muscles, they're so big, we call them vast. So the vast is lateralis, vast is medialis, vast is medialis. They create a ridge here. Where I got letter C, that's called the linear aspirin. It's a very distinctive ring. And just like when you look at the humerus, you have these big condyles. Even though, so rather than being separate names, it's based on the direction. So it sits like this to your right, with the head going to the the torso. And you always know that this is sort of hollowed areas in the way it always sort of lays this way in more concave context. Anterior of the concave posterior. This, so since here, this is the medial condyle on the head side, the lateral condyle. This is the surface for the patella. So with your kneecap, I mean, kneecap doesn't have a whole lot to do other than attaching to the tibia. Where it almost moves up and down is actually here on that surface. Kind of, as, if, as it moves, you eventually. Yeah, kind of those elements. So it has more to do with the femur than the tibia and the fascia. And that brings us to, there's not more than they have left. Here you have the the tibia, and this is where you have cartilage gases. We hear about knee injuries, torn meniscus. Okay, the menisci are there. And what they do, is they're going to be acting a kind of deep in the socket, very large on the medial side, a little less than we're going to look at that today. This is called, you can't really see it so well on this model, this is going to show you. If I have a better specimen. There's like two little bumps, those are the cruciate ligaments, if you're about cruciate. The cruciate ligaments crisscross, and they get a cruciate force. Crisscross. They look like this. And they hold keep their knee from being. But they're easy to handle compared to particularly with a aggressive sport. And then, other than that, there's not a whole lot. Your shin is here, and the big bone kind of overlaps. And again, this would be on your this would be the left side of the bone. It's the fibula, the thinner bone on the right. This is called the medial malleolus. This is the lateral malleolus. They kind of in and answer your question from before, they kind of create the ankle joint. The ankle joint really joins the bone at the top of your foot. This guy is called the talus. So, Tiger Woods had another operation. All the other operations to create arthritis, what they did was they all the joints under here that this sits on can't move because it's wired together. They basically fuse those. They do that for stability, and they do that the same way again. It's doubtful, and I did the greatest top five I've ever seen, and I saw that uh, those two have to be there for I mean, because the back you're constantly here doing that swing. That that's responsible for a lot of your foot stability. But the top of that bone, now where he had surgery, that's really where the ankle is. It's sandwiched, that bone is sandwiched by these two bones. So the typical ankle sprain is you roll your ankle along like this to the outside. That's a typical ankle sprain. So your foot kind of goes this way. And there's three ligaments that hold it. That's not as, they're painful and they swell, they're not as long term as this, where the internal two bones come together. That's called the inferior tibial fibular, fibular joint. That's the so called high angle strain. The ligament here pops and it opens up. And that takes a lot of time. We have to have the seeds to be We used to put a screw in there and hold them together. So that the screw would go. Here, here, and into here, not all the way across. 
So I don't know if they do it the same thing now. We used to do that. So it's, it, and that's the interesting part. It changed so much technology and medicine and surgery, the different materials we use. Uh, when I stopped operating 20 years ago, we had just started, we were using more absorbable materials. We were using more advanced drafting techniques. You know, it was it, it just, Every year it changes dramatically. So that's the rest of the lower extremity. So what you have, I'm just going to finish up and go over the joints and we'll be done. Uh, what we have here, and those are the, okay. Before I finish, real quick, the way you distinguish the hip bone and the femur are really how we distinguish if we just find skeletal remains. Somebody's doing a dig someplace and they find bring up a skeleton. Is it a man or is it a woman? Is it an adult or is it a child? We look at the pelvis. And so this gives you an idea. Okay. You have what's, what they call the inlet and then on the bottom, the outlet. It's about this angle. The wider that angle is, the more obese. Less acute and more, uh, is it obtuse? Whatever. The more it gets past 90 degrees, the more likely it is a man. The more it gets closer and below 90 degrees, the more likely it is a woman. Here's what they look at. It's called the pubic arch. So 80 to 90 degrees and more rounded, more likely female. It creates a wider pelvic opening. In the male, the tilt is different. The angle is quite, quite, quite narrow here. It sort of sits high, and the bones obviously are larger. So when you look at it this way in the female, that wide, the amount of curvature is not as, as severe by the, as you can see by the sacrum. It's, more, it's, more, it's wide and shallow. So when you look at the opening in the female, much more designed for childbearing, less so. So if you ever wonder how small, how a relatively small woman has a baby, it's, it's because of the design itself, it's possible. And the same thing when we look at the femur, it's this part. We would look at the angle. The, the angle is normally about 135 degrees between here and here. As it gets lower, as it gets closer to a 90 degree angle, it's more likely female. As it gets wider, it's more likely male. So those are some interesting parts about it. And the last part are the bones in, as I go through these, the tarsal bones. And there's really only, I would think the, the four major ones are what you would need to be to know. And they're here. You step on your heel, the bone of your heel is called the calcaneus. The bump back here is called the calcaneal tuberosity or Achilles tendon attached to this. The tail sits on top. You have the navicular, which is sort of the fulcrum on the medial or the big toe side, and the cuboid, which is the solid base on the lateral or outer side. So here they are. Calcaneus with the tuberosity. The talus is on top, sits the highest. The navicular, the big bone on the inside, and I don't know if they'll show you. On the outside here, you have the cuboid. So those four. The three, the other three are called cuneiforms because they're wedge-shaped. And there's not a lot to say about them. Other, again, that's the Lisfranc's joint, this joint between the cuneiforms and cuboid and the metatarsal bases. And you see how that second one is set it deep in. That's the one when you hear about a bad Lisfranc's injury. If it's broken there, that's the foundation. So we always were worried about those. And that's basically everything with the bones. And so I'll... Let's see how long we've been going. I can get this all in. Not too difficult. Thank you. I know. I know. This, is, these, this is the one on joints. Joints, to me, I'm going to focus on the individual joints. I will give you some background on the regular joints themselves.
So we hear it. Joints. We classify joints based on their anatomy. By and large, the joints that we are interested in are the ones that move a lot. They're called synovial joints. Synovial joints have a distinct apparatus that allows them to move and be lubricated. Unfortunately for most of you, when you get to be my age, you will have problems with these joints. We have a great name for it, it's called arthritis. And most of us have it to a certain degree. Don't have to worry about it, you're gonna get it. Years ago, my mom was telling me, and so my mom must have been pushing 70 at the time, this was a good 30 or so years ago. And I went, she goes, she was having cataracts. So I go to the eye doctor, I said, I'm really worried about cataracts. He says, oh, you don't have to worry. I said, I don't know, I'm not gonna get him. He goes, no, you live long enough, you'll get him. Something to look forward to. If you live long enough, you're going to get arthritis. Same deal. It's coming. It's most of it is wear and tear and usage. So anyone, if you're in sport and you injure yourself, you're going to have arthritis. If you're active, you're going to end up with arthritis. That's why it's important to know about the joints. If you're fortunate, you don't have a great deal. And there are different types, but most of them come from wear, tear, occupations, injuries, etc. Some people get them because of your immune system. So if you're like me, you have both. <laughs> so we classify the joints based on what they're made out of. And a joint is very simple. Bone, two bones coming together. It doesn't mean they have to move. Fibrous joints move the least. Those sutures I talked about in the skull, where the bones of the skull come together. Those fibers start relatively long. They shorten. As the bones enlarge, the fibers shorten, pull the bones together. Those aren't designed to move. Joints that have cartilage in them move a little. Okay. Synovial joints, elbow, shoulder, wrist, move a lot. Okay. So the two, the only ones that have a cavity are synovial. Fibrous are filled with fibers. Cartilaginous are filled with cartilage. We also classify them on the amount of movement. So in general, fibrous movement, sin means without. Arthrosis means joints or joint motion are immovable. Amphi means some. So the cartilaginous ones move a little bit. Diarthrosis, fancy name, synovial joints, freely moving. So they, the fibrous and cartilaginous ones don't have a joint cavity. It's all about the fibers. So the joints are either the sutural joints in the skull. Okay, that one with the ankle sprain, the inferior tibiofibular joint, that high ankle sprain, that's, a, that's really a tough joint to pop. It generally means your foot gets planted and your leg starts to rotate and it pops it apart. The head of that talus comes into it. And, and I've seen a lot of those over time, right in there. And the one that all of us have that you're familiar with are, is really a joint. There's a, a ligament where the, the sort of anchors your tooth in its socket. It's called a gomphosis. This thing down here. So if you have a tooth extracted, that's the hard part for an adult to go in there to do an extraction to get that periodontal ligament. They have to reach in there and reach in there and free it up and snip somehow that ligament or release it to be able to yank a tooth out. Cartilaginous joints move a little. Some are strictly cartilage. All the growth plates where young people's bones are growing have those. So there's a little bit of motion. So you can see a little bit here between the first rib and the sternum. Motion here. We do see that. And again, when, you're, when they find bones, let's say in a dig archaeologically, you can take an x-ray, and if you just see cartilage, you'll know that it was a child's bone. The size and shape aren't as important as whether or not, and we have it, and those of us who did bones our whole lives, I did. You can look at an x-ray and kind of, if it's a child, 
based on which bones still are to do or do not have a growth plate, roughly estimate the age. You know, like for a missing child that they that was gone for seven years, they find a skeleton which appears to be a male or a female child. Even in the absence of reliable DNA evidence, it's, it's kind of, it's very, very interesting. So there's a number of these. Some joints just have cartilage, for instance where the two pubic bones to cover come together in the front is called a symphysis. And the ones we see the most, that's here. And the other ones where we see a lot of them are those joints that are in, when we looked at the vertebral column, the vertebrae have a fibrocartilage pad that has sort of a soft fluid filled center. Okay. And it has mostly the cartilage on the outside which brings us to the typical joint or synovial joint. The synovial joint, by far the most important. They have a lot of different features and they enumerate them and they have different things that are part of it. I don't go crazy with this in lab. What's interesting is that all of these bones, if you look at any of these, particularly the real bone specimens, you feel the texture here of the bone and then at the end of the bone, because all these bones started as cartilage. And what's left when the bones transition to becoming just bone is cartilage at the ends. It's called articular cartilage. It's a particular type of cartilage called hyaline cartilage. Same cartilage that makes up your nose, your trachea, etc. They have a cavity that's filled with just a few droplets, a relatively small amount of fluid, they are surrounded by what's called a capsule. And capsule is really small. But with any of these joints, you can see the So it's got a tough outer fibrous layer, and the inner layer has a delicate layer with lining cells. Simple squamous lining cells. What they give off are droplets of synovial fluid. For lack of a better way to express it, just a tiny, slightly viscous, kind of like mostly looks like a little bit of an oily component. So it's transfer to lubricate the joints. When you injure your joint, you get more swelling. If you badly injure it, like how do we know if a knee has a torn ligament inside? When you, it fills with blood. My middle child, my younger of my two sons, who's now, who's going to be 39. Next week, today, on the 31st, when he was 16, you ever see them drive, riding BMX bikes with jumps and those kinds of things, those like, like trick bikes, he did that. Like the X game stuff, if you watch that, that are popular around here. When he was 16 years old, he tore an ACL, doing a backflip. Don't have children. Between my wife and I, she made that mistake five times with her first husband, and I made that mistake three times with my first wife. So between two of us, we have eight. So I question you. <laughs> so moving on. So they have a fibrous layer tough on the outside and an inner layer delicate and it produces the fluid and they have ligaments can be part of the capsule ligaments can be outside the capsule and ligaments can be inside the knee has all three that's why the knee is so complex the intercapsular ligaments which have their own lining the cruciate ligaments okay 
the fibular collateral ligament, the ligaments on the outside, what they call the LCL, is extra capsule. It's outside of it. The medial collateral ligament is actually part of the capsule. So it's a very complex joint. So it looks kind of like this, and it's wider than you think. The way it's designed, it's got fan folds in that capsule. And so think of it this way. When you do this with your elbow, this side compresses, this side stretches. When you straighten out your elbow, it's just the opposite. To be able to do that, it's like a pleated sheet that you can We actually see these surgically inside a joint. And it's really important to align them. When we open up a joint and sew it back together, it does this. So you can see this remarkable ability. And we actually are very, very it's really important surgically. I was telling you about that surgery. On the outside of the skin around this guy's elbow, they made a curved incision and they use sterile marking on the side called sterile scribe to make sure everything aligns. And sometimes you'll put that on the inside, right on top of the joint, little marks so you know what to sew back together. That's how important that stuff is. And there's other stuff that are in there. The knee has extra, these menisci, extra pieces of cartilage that are like little gaskets to improve the, the, the fit. Here are, the knee has fatty pads. The knee has extra what are called bursal sacs. All of those are areas where bones might rub together, where tendons and ligaments might cross and damage it. And so we see these, these are little bags of synovial fluid that can become inflamed and swell, but prevent friction. And even have them around the tendons. Like any time, like the tendons going up here at your shoulder, they have a sheath. When we would operate on these tendons for any reason, let's say you tore one or somebody tears one in sport, it's not just enough to sew it together. You've got to make sure it goes back in the sheath. If it doesn't go back in the sheath, it doesn't work. So here's that picture, classic picture of the shoulder. Long head of the biceps this way, the shorter head goes up that way. Anytime a tendon goes around a bend, there's always a sheath. So if this ruptures, normally when you hear about a ruptured biceps tendon in sport, it isn't the tendon that tears, it's the sheath. Basically, you put the tendon back in the sheath and reinforce the sheath. It's typically what's done. Bursal sacs are there to prevent, let's say, structures rubbing against the cartilage. And, what, and, and they make a big mistake in this Whoever wrote this PowerPoint has no idea. I'm sorry. The single most important thing that makes bones security of joints is the shape. If you have, if you have little bones like this that are flat, they move a lot, shifting. If you have bones that are round, like we see them here, and we'll go into the classification. These are called condyloid joints. It's like concave and the convex, and they can move up and down and a little bit side to side. There's a lot of motion. So it's really shallow surfaces are less stable. The ball and socket is very stable in the hip, big, deep socket, shoulder, not. Ligaments play an important role, not minor or limited. Muscles play, the only joint to me where muscles play a particularly important role is the shoulder. The arches of the foot will stand up without muscles. So this guy, whoever did this, didn't read the book. And there are different motions that are associated with it. And it's all about that. So if you have, for instance, in your wrist, all that motion comes from shifting or sliding of multiple flat joints. So it's not one joint, it's all of them working together. The same with you bending your back forward or backward or side to side. Most of the time, when we move something, we flex and extend. In some areas, you can extend more, like bringing your neck or your back way back. You can't do that in the elbow or the knee. 
So with return, so it's all about the bottom planes. In the stacks of the plane, the plane goes this way, flexion and extend. In the trans, uh, the frontal plane, it goes this way, you can A deduct or A deduct. So we always, got it. so it's about certain motions that are there. In the transverse plane, we broke to medially or laterally, internally or externally. The, what makes a ball and socket joint a ball and socket joint is called circumduction. You can move in all three planes. It's like taking your finger and making a circle or your big toe and making a circle. You can't do that with your index finger or your thumb, not quite. That's why it's not considered a ball and socket. Um, so now we look at the joints. We're almost done. So in your wrist or in your ankle, flat surfaces that move a little bit, shift and slide, you add them all together. A true hinge just moves, flexes or extends. That's your elbow. Maybe it's the, the in your fingers and toes here. There's only two joints that pivot. You might remember we had the axis and the atlas, the upper two vertebrae. They're the only ones that pivot. That's one pivoting joint, and the other one is the proximal, the head of the radius into the radial homogeny only. Those are the only two that pivot. Condyloid joints all over. Metacarpal phalangeal joints, metatarsal phalangeal, there's a lot of them. The knee. Concave and convex, they flex and extend, but they can move AD and AB duct. There's only one saddle joint, that's the one I told you about, the base of the first metacarpal phalangeal joint with the trapezium. Two ball and socket joints, shoulder and hip. And then the joint specifics is the last thing that we do. Turn it up. It's just here. You have, so these are the, jo the joints that are unique enough to comment on. The jaw is a hinge, but it has, and what makes temporomandibular joint problems is there's a little cartilaginous disc. It lets, it's good because it gives you more motion. You can shift your jaw side to side, move it front to back, not just open and close. Good news. Bad news is it can create problems, okay? It can, it's the most easily dislocated joint. Not your shoulder, not a finger, your temporomandibular joint. A lot of people have such big problems with that. So underneath that ligament here, where you have mandibular condyle and the mandibular fossa, that cartilaginous disc allows all that motion, but it's very easy to slip out of position. So it almost always dislocates forwards and it has to be pushed back into place. A lot of problems, that's why a lot of people wear one of those, like a bite plate when they sleep or a device when they sleep to limit that. The shoulder is, has the most motion of any joint. Again, the analogy is like a golf ball on a tee. I'll show it to you. So it's got a lot of ligaments, and what the shoulder and the hip have is something called the labrum. They have it sort of in this reddish color. That's like a gasket that's like a cartilaginous lip that makes the surface larger. So if you look at it this way, as I go back, it's a very complicated joint. You have, it's a joint that has a lot of ligaments and a lot of muscles and a lot of these bursal sacs as well as that tendon sheet. So that long head is a stabilizer and then you have four muscles that we call the rotator cuff. Three of them are in the back, teres minor, infra and supraspinatus. They stabilize the back, subscapularis in the front, what makes them rotator cuff is they insert and attach in and around the head of the humerus. 
problem is <clears throat> there's three in the back and one in the front. And because of the anatomy, shoulders dislocate forward and downward. We treated so many of those when I was a resident. They were just calm and you have to pop them back into place. That's what cartilage look like. Beautiful and white compared to the bone, pristine. And they're just showing you some of the muscles that were there. Some of these illustrations. The elbow is basically flexion and extension. The trochlea and the ulna, the humeral ulnar joint. The And you can see it here. It's that the trochlea was that sort of pulley shape that was there. And then you have that one that rotates the head of the radius with a radial notch on the ulna. And the hip, again, just a much bigger cup. There's a, where you have about maybe two thirds of that head encased in the socket of the acetabulum as well as the lip that goes around it. It is, you actually have to, in surgery, when you have a broken hip and you have to replace it, you have to literally pull, and I'm telling you, pull. Okay, when I was a resident, there were all of them. When we were doing surgery, I was by no means the biggest guy there. Okay, the orthopedic surgeon weighed more than I do now and was immensely strong. I mean, he would pull, have to pull that out. Looks just like that. And it's much more ligaments that hold it in place. And then lastly, the knee. The knee is three joints, easily the most complicated one in the body. It has, what do they want? Hold on. Why is somebody calling me? Hold on. Try that again. Uh, hold on. Oh, I see what it is. Hold on. I'll get to that after. Not a problem. So it's three joints. The knee itself is a very small joint between the femur and the patella. It allows a little bit of motion. The big joints are the tibia and fibula, the, I beg your pardon, the tibial, uh, the, 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 the tibial condyles, medial and lateral with the femur itself. They're the ones that have the cruciate ligaments, the menisci, the collateral ligaments, very elaborate joint. This is what it looks like. So the anterior cruciate, prevents the knee, the tibia, from pushing forward. The posterior cruciate back here, even though they're cut away, doesn't allow the tibia to go backward. So you'll see on this, they used to do, now they have a blue tent on in, in sport. So you see in football games, and you don't see it so much in soccer, they just get the guy off the field. But they'll have a player like this, someone will hold this and position or the physio will try to pull the tibia forward and backwards, called a drawer sign. It's like you have a drawer that you're opening, it's broken, and it pops out. That's the anterior. You push it back in, and it goes past where it should. That's the posterior joint. Sometimes they'll both be gone. That's the gaskets. These are the menisci. Thin, in the, in the, thin toward the middle, wide toward the outside, so they create a flat surface and make it more rounded. And then you have the collateral ligaments that hold it. They have a pretty good picture. So you have, and you can see it. The medial, the lateral one is really outside the joint. The medial one is part of that capsule. These are called retinacula. They're fibers. The knee is very, very complicated. <clears throat> Front and back, as you can see. Here's a good view. We used to see this a lot. Before, we were just in the early days of arthroscopy. Now they do most of the stuff through scope. 
where you could actually see the posterior collateral wide in the back, the anterior stronger but more narrow, and the rear end of lateral and medial malleolus. Again, this tibial or medial collateral ligament is actually adherent to the, to the capsule, adherent to the menisci, and typically when you have a really bad injury, all three of these tear, the anterior cruciate, and you'll see it uh, in an illustration, the medial meniscus and the tibial collateral ligament. This one is separate, it doesn't adhere, so you see less problems with it. And so this is what they see, cartilages, cruciate, and collateral ligaments. So they're showing you one where it's being struck typically from the outside, the cruciate, the meniscus, and the collateral ligament will tear. That triad of injuries was described in the medical liter literature about 70 years ago. So it's not anything new under the sun. And that's what it looks like. When you have a arthroscope, the cartilage should be smooth, the meniscus, when it tears, it's irregular. What you do through the scope is it grinds down and smooths this out and you suck it out. Basically, it's a continuous flow of fluid and you suction it out. That's how they repair a cartilage and you just let it fill in the skull. And I think that's everything, all right? We're good. So again, to reiterate, we've been here for an hour and a half of nonstop me. Next week, probably sometime between 12.30 or 1, I'll be in here setting up the practical. I'll open it up. You'll have a word bank. You'll have an answer sheet. Just bring a pen or a pencil. And you can bring in, again, a sheet, standard 8.5 by 11 sheet of copy paper covered back and front with any illustrations, notes, whatever you want. And we'll have that done. So we will do that, and we're done. So I'll see you next week. I'll send you an email to that effect. Thanks.